Hi everyone, this is Olga Mack. Happy Friday, it's good to see everyone. Uh, we are without notes to my legal self, LinkedIn live conversation with Felipe. Felipe uh, is in Barcelona, so this is a transatlantic conversation. I'm very excited about it. Uh, Felipe, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure, well, thank you so much, Olga, for having me. And Good morning uh, to you, and I think good afternoon to somebody else, and good night to others. Um, my name is Felipe Jaramillo. I'm currently based here in Barcelona, as you mentioned. Um, I'm actually working as a senior counsel for Ingram Micro. We're a lot, the world's really largest technology distributor. Um, and uh, I'm here to tell you a little bit about myself, my experience going from the US to Europe now, and, and how this practice of in-house has taken me around the world and and how some of the things that I've done to adapt to it successfully and and some of the things that I continue to have challenges with and uh, just very happy to be here and to be able to share uh, a little bit of myself with you um so if you want I'll get started a little bit from how pretty much how I got here to Barcelona which I think it's it's the most interesting part um I I went to school in the US um I did um finance in undergrad and then I decided to, to go to law school and made that great decision as, as many other attorneys uh, do. And uh, I went to the University of Florida in Gainesville. And there I had what you call a normal US uh, sort of legal uh, schooling. Uh, I did take some classes in international law and I did have an interest in it, but I never imagined that there was gonna be really an opportunity for it. Um, at the time uh, I was uh, after the, the real estate crisis and, and I had, all, worked throughout my undergrad in real estate. So I always had this expectation of, of, of going into real estate law. And through my time in, in, in law school, I, I kind of focused on that. Um, then with graduation coming and, and as everybody looking for your first job out of law school, you're just excited to get working somewhere and to do some type of law, uh, although you don't really know what it is, but, but you just want an opportunity to get started. I found a job doing litigation in, in Miami, and it was in a boutique law firm that they had maritime litigation. Um, it was through networking, and I was honestly, I think at the time, very lucky to, to get that opportunity, and, and that's what kicked off my legal career. Um, I learned a lot. It was a, an amazing experience to, to I think, in, to start off in litigation. Um, we did, I did everything pretty much from motion practice, discovery, and being as a first year attorney, I actually got to sit in on, on two trials, which was amazing. Um, but then quickly, I, I kind of realized that long term, that's not where my heart was. And, and that's really, I didn't see myself doing litigation as, as a senior partner at a law firm, for example. Um, and then out of uh, pure luck, a friend of mine was looking to switch out of his job. And he found a job posting for an in-house counsel position that uh, Honestly, it asked for a lot more experience than I had. Um, it required a lot of, of, of experience in different subject areas that I had no idea about, but I decided to take the step and I applied and, and thankfully I was able to get interviewed. And uh, my boss at the time, Alex, um, I don't know how he took a chance on me and, and I think he saw an eagerness in me to learn and to throw myself at, at something completely new, which I at the time knew it was new to me. And that's when I took my first in-house position with a Fortune 500 um, electrical and security equipment distributor. Um, I was based in Miami and, and there I got an opportunity to work a lot with Latin America as well as the US. But uh, in working with Latin America, thankfully I do speak Spanish fluently and, and that was a, a great tool to have, but I was just open to the opportunity and honestly to just learning about the business and learning about really the nuances of each country where we had offices in each of the countries that I was supporting. Um, I was there for some time and, and I had an opportunity to come up to a, a different distributor, this time in the tech field, which is where I'm at currently in Ingram Micro. And here uh, I made a jump and stayed in Miami working. Um, then the focus uh, sort of centralized in a couple of countries in that time and in our Miami operation. And that was, it was honestly, I, I think a great learning experience again in the sense that now it was the tech field rather than just in-house. Now I, I felt that I already knew what in-house practice was. Now I was learning, it was a new field uh, for me and that was uh, a couple of years ago. 
And then during my time at Ingram, uh, I try to absorb as much as possible as 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 you do when you show up to a new job. I mean, I think that's really the eagerness to learn is is so important. And in that time there, um, out of pure luck, there was an opportunity to um, come over to Europe. And it was basically the attorney that was managing the Southern Europe um, jumped over to manage compliance for our entire EMEA region. And they thought of opening the position internally and they thought of me and, and thankfully they made me an offer to make a move here to Barcelona. And I moved in Bar- to Barcelona a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago. And that's really how I came to to this beautiful city now. <laughs> uh, it is indeed a beautiful city. And, and thank you for that journey from Florida to Barcelona. Um, I, I haven't traveled in, in quite a while. In fact, I, I've been stuck in my beautiful home. But um, And I'm happy to be here. I'm grateful for the uh, health and and, and opportunity to live in a beautiful home. Uh, but I also miss the world. So um, as you were taking us on a journey of um, in your professional journey, I, I had all those images of travel that I used to have and the culture that I used to enjoy. I live in San Francisco Bay Area and recently visited my family in San Francisco, which is about 20 minutes away. And boy, oh boy, that felt like foreign travel. Um, I never thought I would say that. That in San Francisco is where I grew up and went to high school and, and lived 20 minutes away even today. So that was quite an experience. I have a couple of questions because you have an interesting career from sort of Florida to Barcelona, somewhere in the middle. Uh, you did maritime litigation. And as you said, you had normal U.S. law schooling. Um, let's actually talk about the normal U.S. schooling. What do you think uh, in your normal U.S. schooling has prepared you uh, for, uh, for, for, for this journey in, in adventures in international law? Well, I, I think a couple of things. Um, I think during law school, we did have an opportunity and thankfully at, at, at where I went to school, we had a couple of international law classes taught by great professors that they opened our eyes a little bit to all this information we're taking in th- during the first year or two of law school, you're overwhelmed with it. It's, it's so much uh, new information. And then you're so focused on on constitutional law, business law, all these things, torts. And then suddenly when you actually start taking courses on international law, you sort of get hit with the realization that not everything works like it does in the U.S. And and there's many differences in, in, in the judicial systems across the world. And, and when you have international transactions, you have these different systems um, commingling and, and in a way as in-house counsel and as international law attorneys for private practice as well, we're here to sort of uh, navigate our businesses and our clients through it. And and that's really where in, during law school is, I was hit with that first sort of interest of, huh, there is this practice of, of international law. Uh, of course, it, it can mean so many things, but, um, but there is opportunities there. And although at the beginning, I didn't Think I would ever end up doing it. Um, the reality is that years after I graduated and as I sit here, that's actually my day-to-day work. And and so I think that was a great opportunity as to the U.S. schooling, having those international law classes. And I think just honestly, having a little bit of, of luck in regards to who you're able to network with. I mean, I, I've throughout my time, I've met people after law school that, that have had such great um, careers and experiences and that have also been involved in, in significant work uh, across borders that during law school, I never thought that I can get to practice in this field. And, and so I think having those professors to to open your eyes to to what's outside of, of the U.S. from a law perspective was, was a great experience and it helped me in, in what I do today. Yeah, let's talk about maritime law. Well, first of all, I like the lesson network wherever you are, including with your uh, law school colleagues. I mean, I can't tell you how many of, of my law school colleagues are still present in, in my life. So that's uh, absolutely um, a right thing to do. I can't tell you how many folks from my, uh, you know, I, I went to practice law at Wilson Sansini upon graduations, and uh, we had a class of 80 people or so. And mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's really fantastic to keep up with all of them. They're all doing really exciting things. So definitely network uh, and uh, with people where you are today. That's a that's a that's a definitely a great advice. I love it. 
But you mentioned this thing called maritime law, which is the one thing that many people do not practice upon graduation. <laughs> but it could be arguably one of the more interesting paths to international law. Tell us kind of, you know, for those people who may not know what maritime law is and maybe what isn't, right? And and how it may or may not have helped you to be where you are today. Sure. So maritime law, it, it's really interesting because uh, there you have a, a lot of international practice. But, but in reality, when you look at maritime or U.S. maritime law, um, it's it's this entire legal system that's built on on what were the needs of, of maritime needs uh, hundreds of years ago, and and when you look at it, it's a bunch of international treaties and and very old U.S. law and president that set forth this world of of what they call now maritime law, and so I got the opportunity to work at, at a boutique firm there in Miami, which with two great attorneys that that really. One of them, the, the main partner, he has been in it for 40, 50 years. And, and it's incredible the amount of knowledge and the amount of transactions that happen over maritime. So it covers everything where you can imagine transport law, which is really when you buy products and you're moving merchandise from, let's say, China to the West Coast. Um, there, there's significant um, in involvement of maritime law in the sense of whose responsibility is for the products, whose responsibility is for the actual ship itself who's responsible for the crew that's on the ship and everything in and in between that so there's this um lot of disputes regarding insurance coverage disasters that you can imagine happen out in sea um i mean while i was there at the firm we actually and i don't know if you remember that there was this ship that went uh, a shipwreck coin of puerto rico that was called el faro and it was something that had hadn't happened in, in many years, which was a container ship just kind of going under. And, and it happened while I was there at the firm and, and we actually represented one of the families. And it was incredible to just be in the middle of it, of things evolving day to day and seeing news of how this ship was in such a bad shape and, and what, how, what led to it going under. So that was interesting. And then there's another aspect of it, which was also one that uh, we at the firm we were focused on, which was private yachting. And, and people, when I said that, people would always laugh and say, well, you represent uh, wealthy people on their yachts. And it says, well, yeah, not necessarily that What's only. Private, but private yachting or yarding? Yachting. Yarding. So okay. private yachts. Um, and it's really, there's a huge industry behind it when you think about it. I mean, there's there's boats that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, but there's boats that cost hundreds of millions of dollars and, and there's crews dedicated to it. And there's a lot of, of infrastructure and industry behind it. And, and in that there's everything from the brokers and the insurance companies, the repair facilities, the yards where every all of this repair takes place, building of the yachts, uh, where do you register? Do you go to Marshall Islands, the Bahamas, et cetera, et cetera. And then in between all of that, disputes. And, and yeah. that's really where maritime lawyers that do litigation focus on. So it's a federal uh, litigation. And it, it was a very interesting practice. I, I, I never imagined that. I didn't never imagine I was going to end up doing. Uh, but it's one of those things that you see an opportunity and you take advantage and try to learn the most you can. I really love the, the journey that you explained, you know, how maritime law, like anything in law, may have a lot of rich history and a solved problem from maybe a few centuries ago but has an opportunity to control the present and at least dictate kind of where we're going and has this really international aspect. And anyone who has aspirations uh, to practice um, international law, one way to get there is through the maritime law, which is probably one of the more kind of under underappreciated ways of, of getting there. Uh, and sounds like that has prepared you pretty well uh, for your journey. As you transitioned in house, which is a fairly big transition. Uh, what is uh, what is the number one skill you brought in that was helpful? And what is the number one skill that you developed? I think the number one skill that I brought in, um, and I think I mentioned a little bit in the intro, which is um, the willingness to learn. I, I think as attorneys, we, we sort of specialize in this area, which is the practice of law. And then Sometimes when we get things thrown at us, that that is that's something we don't have knowledge on. We feel very uncomfortable, and and I think the best, um, let's say, quality or tool that I brought to going in house was being comfortable with 
with the fact that I did not know everything and being comfortable with the fact that, that I had to learn a lot to be able to do my day-to-day job and that I had to reach out to people and to not be shy about it and to call not only outside counsel, of course, but call uh, the business folks and the operations manager and HR and finance team and, and, and help me navigate the complexities of, of what a business is in order to figure out the legal side. So I, I really think that's, the best quality that I brought forward in regards to going, making that transition of, of going into in-house. Um, and, and I think that's really where um, a lot of attorneys either have a great experience or can have a really bad experience, uh, depending on, I think, on your personality and, and also where you, which law firm you come from and, and where you end up with in going in-house and also the support group and the network you have around you. I think it's a critical part of that. So you mentioned, and I like that you mentioned that um, language skill was very critical uh, in your uh, in, in opportunities. Um, and I really like when people search, when they look for opportunities and want to figure out how to make pivot, they look at their skills uh, much broader and their interests much broader than law. Um, and so that's a really good example. Tell me kind of how you thought through, and you're obviously you're aware of your language skill, but how did you kind of think about uh, connecting the dots and making the move and actually taking advantage of, you know, what is not really a legal skill. It's more of a, I guess, human skill or heritage skill, uh, something that is kind of part of you. Totally. And, and, and I think nowadays it's, it's even more important than ever. I, I, I wish I knew more languages. I only know English and Spanish. And sometimes definitely in my current role, I, I feel I'm missing out on a lot of, of useful experiences and, and and a lot of information that I could be tapping into if I knew more languages. But I knowing um, Spanish and being able to take advantage of that, of course, it was an interesting experience going in house where uh, I had to not only support in the day to day with with just generally speaking and writing in Spanish, but also the legal practice in Spanish. And and that's really where I had a, a steep learning curve in regards to going from being a U.S. Uh, trained attorney to start reading briefs in Spanish, although I've spoken and, and, and can read the Spanish perfectly, it's a whole different world. Oh, it is a different skill, let me tell it you. It is I, completely I, I different. different. People tell me that I speak with a 13 year old, um, even though I'm fluent, uh, but it doesn't mean that I, uh, I, I'm fluent in reading even, but it's, it's very different to have a comfort level and have enough vocabulary um, to to be fluent in a business legal context, which is a very right. sophisticated. You're not just trying to understand. You you you're trying to sound like a you know counsel uh, that people trust and take advice from. And that's a whole le- level of fluency that is more than just oh Olga speaks Russian or Philippe speaks Spanish. Um, it's 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 exactly. you know you sound like you went to school somewhere in a Spanish speaking country. Right. Exactly. That's a very different level and of understanding of law and, and communicating. Exactly. And it even goes country to country. Uh, honestly, I've had experiences uh, here after I moved to Spain in my uh, one month into my new job, speaking with the business. Um, I refer to what they call here a, a warehouse. I use the wrong word that we use in, in Latin America. And to them, what I had said was not a warehouse, but was a storage space for wines. So when I mentioned this, yeah, you, you upgraded your company. You become <laughs> exactly. more. Exactly. Well, I, I literally, to translate it to English, I literally said, well, our storage space for wine can hold how much inventory? And, then, and one of them just said, well, I wish I had enough a storage space for wine in my house, but I, I, I didn't even understand the joke. So it goes to simple things like that. <laughs> the cultural differences make a difference. And here we're talking, the, we're speaking the same language. And, and even within the same language, um, there's many things that you have to learn from a business and legal perspective that, that make it quite interesting. Well, make sure whenever you have a storage conversation, you don't end up uh, you know, having your wine conversation, which may or exactly. may not upgrade depending on the audience. Um, <laughs> exactly. Very interesting. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit. Uh, but, you know, we're gonna we're gonna answer, but I do want to talk about a couple of things. One about mm-hmm. managing a region, because many in-house lawyers, actually in the United States, you know, having a Latin uh, American region or a MIA region is something that you see either as an entire duty or additional duty. Um, you know, besides the language skills, uh, what other skills can you acquire? Um, you know, how do you approach that practice? Do you have any kind of best practices tips? 
I think the best practice that, that I can honestly and the best tip that I can give to somebody in a similar situation, and even if it's not an international practice, but it, especially if it's an international practice, is, is creating genuine and, and rewarding relationships with with the business. I mean, I really think the best thing that I that I did and I can do if at any point during my career, I, I continue to make changes at the the region I support is is getting to know my team, the HR team, the finance team, the operations team, the sales team, and and getting to learn what is their day to day, what is their challenge, what are their challenges, uh, where are their areas of opportunity, and what is their vision as to what a legal team can can provide them. And I think once we develop those relationships, it just makes your job so much easier. And and people are so open and willing to help you succeed that that it takes that effort at the beginning and it has to be on your side. Uh, you're really the one that's going into a new region, that's assuming new responsibilities. You're the you're really the new guy on the block. And and so I really take that to heart and and make an effort to try to build those relationships as best and as quickly as possible. Um, okay. And I think I can leverage that throughout my entire period that I work with them uh, for the benefit of both. The question I have is around, look, I mean, actually picking up all your stuff, even from Florida, you know, it's a little closer to Barcelona from Florida than it is from, say, California, but still, you know, moving, moving yourself and your family is a big adventure. How do you, how do you get comfortable with that decision? You know, it took me about five years to make my, my husband comfortable with a 20 minute move. You know, we recently <laughs> moved to a new house 20 minutes away. And I spent like a lifetime having him getting comfortable there. So tell us the secrets of getting your family comfortable and yourself comfortable to completely changing the countries. And and, and how, how do you make that move? I'll, I'll add in something, Olga, that they probably, I, I think I might have shared with you before, is when I made the decision to actually move, I had just found out that my wife was pregnant a week before. So that even made it more interesting because now it was not only the two of us and a dog, but now it was... The three of us making and, the and a dog, a pregnant and wife a dog. and a dog. Okay, you exactly. have some skills with it. You definitely <laughs> have some skills, so do tell us. <laughs> no, but I, I think the best way to approach it is is just being honest with yourself that it's going to be a challenge. And and I really took that to heart. And when I sat down, and it's a family decision at the end of the day, as you mentioned, convincing your husband is is not. If you're convinced and he's not, it's going to make it equally as difficult. So like, convincing my husband really solves all problems. I mean, I, I think <laughs> for anyone of us who is happily married, right? If you have a true partnership, you know, this art of persuasion becomes paramount. So that's why I'm I'm, I'm dying to hear the story. So when we took the decision, or we didn't before we even took it, I, I was very honestly grateful and thankful to to getting the opportunity. And then we started actually thinking after all the excitement and celebration, we started thinking about all the details. And, and that's really when it gets a lot very overwhelming. Um, so what I did is, is I sat down and I started sort of developing a plan in regards to, OK, everything related with, um, let's say, taxes, everything related with the actual move itself, everything related with looking for an apartment, everything related with looking for a car. And it started breaking it down sort of by little sub chapters as to this big Barcelona move. But then uh, to, to realize how complicated it was going to be, by the time I finished this, I, I realized it was going to be complicated and challenging, that for sure. Uh, but the next thing I did, I, I reached out to a couple of, of what I call within my network, a couple of other attorneys, both in-house and, and, and that are private practice. And I shared with them, I said, listen, I, I got this opportunity to go to Europe and I'm going to be working with Spain, Italy and Portugal. What do you think? I mean, what, what's your perspective? If you were in my shoes, how would you sort of uh, visualize it. And and honestly, the feedback I got was was amazing. Some people gave me very interesting things to think about. One person told me, I don't think it's the best idea. <laughs> but the, 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 the rest of the people told me- Do not I, do it. Do not exactly. do it. I think he was honestly more concerned about the fact that I was gonna bring my pregnant wife to have a baby here, that rather than the professional side of, of, of the opportunity. But then, <laughs> Getting all that feedback was great. Oh, because I'm less concerned about your legal career. I am more exactly. concerned about the state of your marriage. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly. a very caring advice, I guess. Exactly. And I appreciate it because it was it, it was going to be true. And it was. It was a very interesting challenge, let's say. But uh, having all that feedback was great because by the time I, I sat down with my wife, 
we sort of took a decision saying, okay, this is a commitment for a couple of years, but it's honestly an experience that that comes only once in a lifetime, and it, and it's the sort of thing that it, if you if we are motivated and and if we are going to be able to take advantage of it to the max, you know, then then we should jump on it, and 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 we just have to think things through and and calmly prepare as best as possible and and be prepared for surprises along the way. And and there were many surprises along the way, including the fact that we got here and three months after we were in lockdown. <laughs> but <laughs> but well, that's that's the sort of things that, that come with opportunity. And and it's there's been a lot of uh, pros that outweigh that that. Uh, let's say unfortunate series of events. That's COVID. But on the other side, I think if anybody that's listening ever has an opportunity or similar opportunity, to even move to a different city or a different region, although you may be overwhelmed with uh, the, the complications of it or how how challenging it's going to be, uh, reach out to different people and and get their feedback and perspective on it because they will share with you a lot of the pros that honestly in the moment you might not be seeing. Yeah, yeah, I love this story. And I actually, I'll tell you what I really love is your project management approach to changing <laughs> from United States to um, to to Europe. That maybe not would have been my approach uh, because I, I know the the result of this is that once you list everything down, you pretty much change your mind because that's <laughs> the most convincing way to get there. But uh, I love the dedication. Uh, that sounds great. Managing outside council when you manage territory is actually even a more important skill than it is normally for in-house lawyer because you 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 definitely not an expert not only in all laws but no, also in not in all jurisdictions. Yeah. Uh, even if you are fluent in language, so if you can give a few quick tips in managing outside lawyer and maybe hiring one or a couple, how mm-hmm. do you do this? Uh, because that's a very useful skill. Sure. So my my approach has always been trying to first get to meet them in person. Uh, the attorneys that that are working, I, I've had this happen to me already two or three times that I've taken over a region or different countries with different outside counsel, and I've always uh, made sure to take a, a good amount of time, either an hour, and if I can actually do an in person visit, it's even better to get to know them and understand the history that they've had with with the company before I showed up. Um, not assuming that I know all the history, I think it's very important. And then trying to build a relationship and, and being very, let's say, uh, at least that's my approach, but being very forward with the fact that during my time there, I might make changes and I might ask for things that are different than what they've done in the past. And that if they're ever uncomfortable with any of my requests, be it either on the billing side or of, the way I, I ask questions or the timelines that I give them for, for different projects to, to let me know in the moment rather than just um, be quiet about it. And I think that really opens the door to them understanding that I'm there to build a relationship with them. I'm not there to come and knock everything down. And and once they get that level of comfort, uh, we've had great conversations and some of them have ended with me ch- making changes in council. And I think only one time out of let's say five or six times that that's happened uh, it's been on on not necessarily the best of terms but but the other opportunities has been in great terms and they've been very understanding realizing that that what i was looking for an outside council wasn't what they're they're interested in offering so it, it's best to have a, a, a client go out the front door than, than out the back door and 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 the same the other way around i i was happy to hear their feedback in regards to what they saw my predecessor was doing correctly and, and what they think wasn't working. And there's always things that uh, during the time that you're in the role that, that might not be working and, and your outside counsel might not share that with you, but might share that with the new person that comes to your position. So when you are that new p- person, try to take advantage of, of that first interaction or those first couple of interactions to gain that insight and, and get that feedback. We're coming to the end. I know you're going to be speaking much more at the Future of Contracts webinar series. And contracts are definitely part of the many international journeys. Um, give us a, a quick summary of what you're going to be talking about in March. I and mean, I will put the comment. Uh, I'll put the link to registration for folks to register uh, in the comments. But why don't you share what you're going to talk about in maybe one or two minutes, and then we'll say sure. our quick goodbyes. So uh, the plan for March is, is to take a, sort of what a, a, an expedition into contract uh, negotiation. Uh, I had the pleasure of, of, of working on an article on that subject with the co-author, and 
And what we tried to lay out was the seven different sort of steps that we visualize in regards to a successful contract negotiation. Um, and during the talk in March, Olga, what I what I want to do is walk through a little bit uh, the two sides of the coin, which is let's say a, a vendor client relationship and how you can set yourself up for success by trying to follow these seven steps. I cannot wait for that conversation. I, I am really grateful for, for you sharing your one, one journey in international law uh, from Florida to Barcelona. Sounds like a fantastic journey. I, I know many legal professionals would like to replicate it. Uh, more importantly, thank you for sharing the personal journey. Uh, I'm glad that you and your wife and your dog are all doing well and you are enjoying uh, your, your life in Barcelona. Maybe a little, not quite what you imagined, but sounds like you're doing very well. And I'm very much looking forward to your leading the webinar uh, in March. No, thank you so much, Olga, for, for the opportunity. And thank you everyone for, for connecting and listening. And if you have any questions as to anything regarding what we discussed today or, or the March webinar, please feel free to reach out. And, and we're here to help each other out. So thank you so much for the opportunity and hope you have a great weekend.